In October 1972, a charter plane carrying a Uruguayan rugby team bound for Chile crashed high in the Andes Mountains. For more than two months, the survivors kept themselves alive by eating the flesh of those killed in the crash. My guest today survived that ordeal 34 years on. Does his remarkable story have lessons for us all? Nando Parado, welcome to Hard Talk. My pleasure to be here, Siren. Thank you. Is there a single day that goes by when you don't think of the crash of that plane on October the 13th, 1972? Yes, I would say many, many days go by when I don't think so about those things. Sometimes when I get to a different or difficult situation in my life, I remember, Jesus, if I could have done that, I can do this, but it's gone. I mean, time is a good healer. It's like I just read a book about what happened. In that sense, you are healed, are you? I think I'm healed from... Uh, I don't think if I ever had to heal, you know, because I was so happy to get out of there that I embraced life with uh, both arms and legs and everything, and I never looked back. My father told me when I got out of there, you have a life to live, don't look back. That's what I did. I want to explore that comment of your father later in the interview, but let's look back. Let's make you look back today and start by observing that actually that plane that you were in on that particular day should never have been in the air, should it? The pilots clearly didn't want to fly on that uh, Friday the 13th because the weather was very bad in the Andes. I think that's uh, a lot of uh, things and folkloric things that the press later uh, made bigger, but I think that two professional pilots would be never be bullied by a bunch of rugby, young rugby players to get off the of the ground. I mean, the weather was marginal, I think, and uh, we wanted to get to Chile and say, okay, come on, let's go, let's go. But the pilots, they are the ones who, I mean, who, who fly the plane. They, they could never, ever be pressured by a, a group of guys who were 17, 18, 19 years old. Right? There, there were 45 people on the plane. You were mostly rugby players going to play a match in Chile from Uruguay. What was the mood on board, as you remember it? Uh, rugby teams are, I think it's a beautiful sport, and rugby team members are quite happy. I mean, we love to play the game. We love to party afterwards, and we were going at the end of the season. You know, it was the last game of the season. So we were, we were looking forward to this trip to Chile, to see our friends there, to see our girlfriends there, to have nice Chilean wine, you know, and... Uh, but the happy mood was fantastic on the airplane. Do you remember the crash itself? I remember that I didn't have time to get afraid, to be afraid. I just saw that we were flying too close to the mountains, but that took only three, four seconds, and then the plane hit the mountain head on. And this is the only plane crash in history, I think, where you can find survivors when a plane crashes at cruising speed and at cruising altitude. And I just remember the sound, the met awful, horrible metallic sound. I, I like metallic sounds, but this was horrible, absolutely horrible. And the roof, the, the roof of the airplane opened in one tenth of a second, and then everything was black for me. I fell I, into a dark, complete, soundless, dark place, which I don't know what it was. Your, your mother and your sister were on board. Did you get the chance to say anything to them in the midst of this very short-lived panic before you actually crashed? Nothing. I, I didn't have a single second. I, I just looked at them and the plane hit the mountain. So uh, my mother died on impact, on the first impact, and my sister died about five days later after the impact. She had very bad internal injuries and uh, she never came back to her senses. She couldn't speak, uh, she couldn't elaborate a, a, a thought, but she could breathe, she could look, I could remember her eyes, but uh, she couldn't speak. But you were conscious, you were with her when she died because you'd been in a coma, but you yeah. had emerged from that coma by the time your sister passed away. Yeah, I had uh, four fractures in my head, 
my friends tell me that the, my head was the size of a basketball and I was completely covered with blood and I came back to my senses three and a half days later and um, I crawled to where my sister was and she died two and a half days later in my arms but uh, there was nothing we could do there there were no medical aid kits there no medicines no bandages nothing absolutely nothing I'm trying to imagine a man who a young man who has fractured his skull has terrible injuries who's actually been left to some extent to die by his friends because they thought he was beyond help he wakes up discovers what has happened and also discovers that his mother is dead his sister is dying at that point do you feel your your spirit was almost broken I mean that's the situation you're on there's no way you can change it and the reality bites and hits you as hard and as fast as you know a, a bullet uh, I realized I was on a plane crash my mother was dead and you're in a different environment your mind works on a different wavelength and so fast instinct overrides logical thoughts you know and then it's like an alien brain that is, is inside you and I said okay I want to cry but I couldn't cry you couldn't I, cry I couldn't cry because the instinct said you cannot cry because if you cry you will lose salt and water with your tears and you will need that to survive here I, I, I find it hard to believe you were that rational that logical as soon as you woke up from a coma and were faced with the process having lost your your nearest and and dearest you, you really could be that cold about it I think uh, instinct is uh, beyond what we can comprehend and that's the way I was thinking I said what can I do this is what's happening this is the facts and I cannot cry I cannot cry because my instinct doesn't allow me to cry so you your instinct and your determination at that early point was to survive you oh, felt yeah no problem I, I the idea want, of survival I didn't want to die of course and uh, I think that at the moment that somebody knows that he's going to die everything changes in one second Stephen more faster than anybody can even imagine let's say that you go to the doctor the one that treats you every year and you get there and he puts his hand in your shoulder and says Stephen I'm sorry you have a week maybe instantly your mind changes it doesn't come to this TV studio to your next interview next week it goes someplace else another Steven gets inside that brain and it's like that that happened to us you know you we couldn't be rational it was another planet another environment another life another pressure and we changed I know from from reading your book about this this experience that there, there were divisions there were differences in the way people reacted and you describe how some of the young men including yourself basically looked for practical solutions and looked to do work and to make the situation better while others were overwhelmed with fear and with apathy and really couldn't do anything for themselves so it wasn't as though everybody reacted in the same way of course nobody has the same personality but everybody knew how bad the situation was but um, for example there's a fantastic boy he survived his name is Bobby Bobby Francois and uh, he's exactly now like he was there he said we are dead there's no way we can get out of here and he never did anything in 72 days and 72 nights you know you and he'll never done anything to help the collective yeah he he said we are so dead that it's useless to fight you know so why should we fight let's die as soon as possible and now he says I have proved that without doing anything you can survive because you saved me you see <laughs> they they saved me that's what he says well you right. saved him but were you at the time furious with him uh, no we sometimes you got furious with other guys that were more apathetic like you say because there's also depression there is fear remember this is only the first two or three days that these things happen how does a mind work when you're abandoned to die when you come from the doctor and you get home and say okay I'm gonna die how does you how do you think some guys who go to a doctor react in a different way some embrace life and want to do everything in that week before they die some go and embrace their parents you know and uh, some were more apathetic in in the labor in the work we had to do because we had to take care of the fuselage you know close the wall we had made 
clean it, you know, take care of, of our refuge, you know. But uh, I think the fact that we were a rugby team, we knew each other at least for 10 years before the crash, that was very, very important. Had this happened to a commercial airliner, maybe, and I don't say, I don't say it wouldn't happen. Imagine people with different ages, different backgrounds, different ethnics, different uh, uh, languages, people traveling alone, people with their families, you know? If there was a piece of bread on that airplane and I was traveling with my little girl, would I give it to somebody I don't know whom he is? I don't know, you know? I would save it for my girl. Here, everybody was so good. We were like angels. We shared everything. Let, let's talk about the, the practicalities, particularly the food. You, you had snow and you figured out a, a way to melt the snow for water so you could deal with the thirst to some extent. Some days, only when there was sun. But uh, that was only less than one third of the days. And that, at that altitude, at 14,000 feet, you dehydrate five times faster than at sea level. So you need water, you crave for water. Thirst is unbearable. What can you do? You just put snow in your mouth or eyes. But after a week, all your lips are completely cracked and bleeding because there's no chapstick, there's nothing. The temperature is absolutely horrible. And if you put ice and snow, it, it hurts a lot, but it was the only thing we could do. That's the thirst. And then, of course, there's the starvation. And you describe in the book how... And there's the cold. And there's the cold. The cold is the worst. The cold burns like acid, you know? If you're minus 30 degrees with summer clothes, a sweatshirt, a polo shirt, how slow does one night go by? Have you tried to sleep inside a, a freezer? You know? It's very long. It hurts. It's bad. It's the most horrible thing you can imagine. Then we'll come to the food because I'm just uh, fascinated by one description you give where you say you looked on the wound of a young boy who was lying near you in the wrecked fuselage which was your only shelter and you say quote I felt my appetite rising as you looked at this wound and this vague scent of blood it's a very honest thing to write but also to many people yeah an extraordinarily horrible but you, have, you have also have to read the previous paragraph and the future paragraph. Yes, we felt that because we were in a different environment. And after not eating for 10 days, it's like being on Mars. What do you do? You just die looking at the face of the guys in front of you. And we were so advanced as a civilization there, imagine, so advanced that 34 years before society understands things, now people sign papers and say, I'm a donor. I want to donor my organs if I die and I saved the life of my friends, of my family. We did that 34 years ago. We made a pact and we said, if I die, please use me so that at least one of us can get out of here and tell our families how much we love them. Well, you, you make it sound, again, a, a totally unanimous collective decision, but you had a debate, didn't you, amongst you survivors about uh, whether to eat the flesh of uh, those but, who but died. It's a very, yes, we, of course, it's not, okay, come on, let's do it now. It takes half an hour, 45 minutes, one hour to discuss in darkness at night on a 14,000 feet glacier lost in the Andes. We didn't know where we were. We didn't have a clue where we were. We had been abandoned. The search has had been abandoned. We had listened to that on a small transistor radio. So if we add all those things to the fear we had, the hunger, the fear, the cold, the thirst, the depression, it comes to a different mind. Yeah, and, and yet two of the bodies outside in the snow were the bodies of your mother and your sister. Yes. You knew that in the end you might have to yes. consume their flesh. Yes. I would give the kid, my kidney to my daughter without any problem now, if she would be alive. I don't know if you have a family, but I mean, if you have a son or a daughter, you would. I do. And she needs a kidney. What would you do? We did it with... Uh, total convincement that it was the only thing we could do. I wouldn't be here. Well, I wouldn't have a family. When you looked at your fellow survivors and you knew by this time you'd been, let's say, weeks without any prospect of salvation and as we now know it ended up being more than two months. When you looked at your fellow survivors, did you think that this could come down to a macabre sort of end game 
where you would be looking at the last few survivors and each would need another to die to get more sustenance to keep them alive. I mean, at some yeah. point, it becomes it, very brutal. I thought it? about that, and I said, I won't be here. Because I had, people say, I had that vision, you know, so many people. I saw that coming. What would happen at that moment? What would I do? Maybe I would be dead because people were dying because of avalanches, of gangrene, of a lot of things. And I said, I won't be here. I'm going to get out of here. I couldn't get out of there earlier enough because I was not prepared. We didn't have equipment. We didn't know where we were. We had to prepare, uh, you know, shoes to walk on the snow, walking sticks, sunglasses to fight the glare of the glacier. We had to manufacture a sleeping bag to fight the cold at 18,000 feet. But I saw, this will come to that, what you're saying. What will happen? I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be dead on the mountains. Well, did you, never mind the physical, death, yeah. but did you feel morally degraded as you had to eat more and more of the bodies outside of the fuselage where you were sheltering? Bones were just strewn around, human remains, as you had to eat them. Did you feel towards the end of this terrible ordeal that your, your basic humanity, your spirit was being degraded? No, I thought that we were so elevated towards a different uh, wavelength of survival of fighting for our lives that life came to such a spiritual way of being such a beautiful thing to fight for your life in that way now when I see people that you know they just throw airplanes into buildings or they just blew them blow themselves up and kill kids and that's degrading that's absolutely the worst thing a human being can do but try to survive, it's the opposite, you know? The opposite of death is love. The opposite of death is fighting for your life, not looking to die. You stress love. The opposite of death is love, you say. Some of your fellow survivors talk about God. And indeed, because you were one of the two who in the end left the wreckage and went to seek help, they've described you as the sort of... Uh, the vehicle by which God, used by God, to deliver uh, help to everybody. Do you see it that way? Do you feel you were used by God? I prayed as much as they did, just in case. But I also had my own plans. I said, I have to get out of here. One of the guys who died there, Arturo, he was 19. And when you're 19, you only think about girls, sports, and some studies. And he read a lot about theology, and we discussed with him a lot in the plane in those long nights about theology. And we came to some conclusions, and he said, we must be allowed, allowed to doubt without guilt. All the religions punish you if you don't believe, if you don't have faith. You know, you have sins, you go to hell, you go to heaven, you have to do such and such things, but we found a God that's different, a God that doesn't have the logic to kill my family and save me. You know? Why? They were much better than I was. My friends, the guys who died were much better than we were. Well, did you feel survivor's guilt? No, whatsoever. We are so happy that you cannot even imagine. We feel the loss. Why not? I mean, I wish I had them. Panchito Abal and Guido, my two best friends since we were six years old, they but, died. And, and your mother and your sister. And my you mother and my feel sister. any guilt about what? No, the you know fact why? that they... Because when you understand that you cannot modify what happens, if I could be able, I would be a magician or some kind of spiritual being that could modify it, but I would go back and modify it. I can't. Did you what find, did you find um, uh, complete understanding from the family members of those who had not survived and who had been eaten when you emerged and told your story of survival? Absolutely, up to now. I mean, we belong to the same neighborhood, to the same community. And uh, they wrote a letter to us and to the newspapers and to the media. And they said, we are lucky that there were 45 people on board so that we can have 16 sons back. Remember that we belong to the same community. They took us to school, you know, on Mondays and Tuesday, my mother on Wednesdays and Thursday, you know, all through our lives. So we know them since we are six years old. And they understand that nobody chose to live or to die. Were you selfish 
Is that one reason you survived? Selfish about, I don't know, what, over there. Well, I, selfish no. about all sorts of things one can imagine. Selfish about making sure you got a decent place within the shelter to keep, not warm, but to keep out some of the bitter cold. Selfish perhaps about sometimes making sure you got a bigger hunk of meat. I, I don't know, but I, I know no. just having talked to Holocaust no, no, survivors, I, there is something deeply selfish about the will to survive. No, I think that leaders sometimes uh, are completely opposite to what people think. I think leaders have to be compassionate, have to be friendly. And in the first book, Alive, which is written by the 16 survivors, 15 described me as the most gentle character there. You know, I never used my powers for anything. I helped everybody. I sacrificed my places. I gave them warmth. I embraced them. And then I saved them. So I think I, I'm not selfish. Why have you written a book, as you have done, so many years, 34 years now, since this crash? Usually when something happens, you know, mountain tragedy or sailing tragedy or something happens, the people involved write a book and six months later it's out. I waited 33 and a half years to write it. Why? I don't know. Is it a different book now than it would have been if you'd written it in the months, maybe the couple of years after the event? No, no, this is a book I couldn't have written 10 years ago. This is a book about my life, about my family, about everything that happened to me after the crash. I couldn't have had an outlook on my life. No, the, I, I, I couldn't have written anything like this before. No way. And I wanted this to be a present for my father. I wrote it for my father, for my family. I want to bring you back to your father because we began with your father yes. and what he said to you, don't let this event be the most important thing that ever happens to you. Haven't you actually made it the most important event by writing this book? I think that if we want to be perfectly honest, this was a big thing. It could have been anybody's life, you know? It's, uh, I cannot get away of, I get away from it, but I have a stamp in my back, you know? For 35 years, I never looked back. I never spoke about it. I was busy building my businesses, racing my car, my offshore boats, having my family, having my friends, you know, um, building my television station. Um, one day, I started to write for my father. And we are all creatures of what we have learned, what they taught us, the mistakes we have made. And that's what we are. That's part of my life. I cannot deny it, but what I have. Nanda Parado, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you, Stephen. A pleasure. All right.